when a film or painting captures our creativity. Our initial reaction is to create an impression of its similar themes and structures. And in contemporary filmmaking, Quentin Tarantino stands as the poster boy for this process, with every one of his films being a portrait of genres and characters made by creators he admires the most, shamelessly wearing his inspirations on his sleeve. There's a film that perfectly displays Tarantino's extensive love and knowledge for film itself. Kill Bill, a story of vengeance. A story containing samurai swords, double barrel shotguns, pistols, church bells, and pregnancy tests. A story that follows a mother who lost her unborn daughter during a massacre on the same day as her wedding. Lost to a lifestyle she tried to escape from. An ex-assassin comprised of the most dangerous in the world. Group name, the Deadly Viper Squad. Vanita Green, Oren Ishii, Bud, Ellen Driver. Every one of them led under the banner of the mystical figure, Bill the arranger of the bride's massacre. And now, turn to revenge. She proposes to burning down the worlds of these members that torn apart her own. A self-assigned mission to break down spirit, bone and connection, making her way to kill the king on the far across mountain. It's an ambitious story, broken down and split into two volumes. The first sets up a story of mystery and ultra-violence, a bloodbath fairy tale against Oren Ishii and her barrage of bodyguards. And the second broadcasts an unfolding backstory and the conclusion to her revenge. But against a simple description, subversion can be found lurking behind every closed door. In a story where battles last over 20 minutes, full of gruesome deaths. The final duel between Beatrix and Bill lasts under 30 seconds. A drop of blood. By the time we realise what's happening, it's already over. And with a heavy narrative that's then blended with playful mannerisms highlighted in cartoonish plot devices and effects, it knows when to buy into ridiculous fantasies using the cliches most applied to the martial arts genre, utilising it as a springboard to implement age-old premises. Stalemates between masters are avoided by using corollary secret techniques associated with practice at the highest level. Levels that are bypassed and formed into a highly stylized growth. Montage training. And between these playful mannerisms, it knows exactly when to take itself seriously. Paying attention to characters and story with a laser point precision. Every death fitting the character's vices. Oren born and surrounded within martial arts, underestimated for being a woman, becomes her direct downfall for demeaning and underestimating her opponent and an antagonist such as Bud, whose ignorance to the culture he's surrounded in makes him gullible to the traps set by his teammates. Behind all of the style and excess, there lies an extraordinarily woven plot that respects the tales told by other storytellers. It's a story fueled with rage, pain, regret, joy, and love. Cathartic stings and quiet burns. Wrapped inside, nearly every aspect of creativity can be traced back to previous works. Quentin Tarantino embracing the greatest parts of older material, lifting it from their worlds and breathing new life into his own creations, opening up a world of influences. The spaghetti westerns of Sergio Leone, incorporating double exposure shots through barren landscapes and extreme close-ups during standoffs. The Deadly Viper Assassination Squad, echoing the Shaw Brothers Kung Fu classic, The Five Deadly Venoms. And the legendary Sonny Chiba, casted as the great Hattori Hanzo, a cast member who starred in the Japanese TV series Shadow Warriors, an 80s show Tarantino admitted to taking inspiration from. Both volumes drawing an aesthetic adapted from Seiji and Suzuki, that being the Technicolor jazz soaked environments of Tokyo Drifter for the first feature and branded to kill for the latter that offers a stark, high contrast black and white habitat that volume 2 utilises so well during flashbacks. Kill Bill uses every scene to whisper or shout homage, but the one film that Kill Bill draws most from visually is hands down the 1973 classic revenge tale Lady Snowblood. Quick zooms, crimson contaminated waters, snow-glazed battles with deep red blood trails.
costumes, shot types, and environments contained in an origin story consisting of a protagonist who lost her entire family to the arms of criminals, a narrative that's shared with Beatrix losing her daughter and Oren losing her parents during childhood. But the inspirations of Kill Bill doesn't begin and end visually. The score of Lady Snowblood, for instance, is borrowed to be part of Kill Bill's soundtrack. And much like those wide open spaces Quinton was so fond of from classic westerns, he also turns towards Sergio Leone's frequent collaborator, who's responsible for composing that captivating and flowing music so frequently used in the Dollars trilogy and Once Upon a Time in the West, this being the first collaboration between the two. And much like the masters of cinema, who create a smorgasbord of emotional strains, Kill Bill applies every specific emotion to a piece of music, rising to a cinematic experience unlike any of Tarantino's previous films, which was lent more towards a playlist of pop culture designated toward underscoring the era the film's based in. Kill Bill balances inspirations from both American and Asian content, merged into a mixture of Japanese martial arts samurai aesthetics and the orchestral texture of the Deep West full of cowboy hats and standoffs. From the visual and audio elements to the opportunities that the revenge narrative can bring, it goes above and beyond, giving Kill Bill the opportunity to become Tarantino's most emotionally charged film. Bang, bang, my baby shot me down. Tarantino respects what he takes from, doesn't pander, and clearly just loves what he does. You could claim plagiarism on his work, and many have tried, but it's the principle that it recreates the image instead of taking from the film directly that strengthens his ability to take inspiration. Reintegrating these moments into a completely different narrative to announce respect to the stories he admires the most. Have you ever put so much of yourself into making something, only to stand back and realise how derivative it is? then inevitably having a crushing self-doubt that you have no artistic identity or any individual way to express an emotion that would amount to anything without plagiarising from creators you admire the most? I mean, it's never happened to me. But what if, just once, you decided to hold on to that idea and run to the finish line, embrace the derivative aspect, take the opportunity to perform a great imitation and blend your inspirations with the passions you have? Who knows what could happen? Pulp Fiction was just a collage of overdone stories, and it's only when you apply Quinton's perspective, warping structure and applying his dialogue do you create a genre and a flood of imitations. Very few storytellers try the risk to bound from genre to genre, even much so in singular films. Tarantino flaunts his inspirations. He's a storyteller who unapologetically picks from the branches of other creativity, compounds and blends them into a singular breathing experience and designs a completely new and refined piece of work in the process. And much like the decades of films Tarantino grew up with that shaped him into the filmmaker he became, these works that fueled his creative ambitions by punching multiple elements into his own. I'm excited to see what the next generation of inspired storytellers who've been raised upon works such as Kill Bill will have to say and show to us. <laughs>